don't ask, like some Russian stuff, man. So, I think in the version of Matthews, uh, you, it begins, I will begin with this statement. There was world in the beginning. And the entire creation came from the world. And the world was with God. Something like that. I paraphrase with it, my own words. So, even in Christian mysticism, this idea that the universe has originated from a sound, from a word, is there. Of course, it is there in the Hindu philosophy. It is there since the Holy past. In Vedas, it is there. For example, the Jamakra, like that. as an example. So, the creator, it is like the pot maker. The pot maker said within himself, pot. That is what he said to himself, pot. And then, man, that sound into a thought or an idea translates as the pot. Similarly, the creator, the, the God himself, the creator, we say creator, the God is God, the creator, he said, Yahweh, he said, what he said, that is the sound that he said, and then uh, the act is created. Like that, the creation story goes on. And so, the entire creation has its origin in this sound. Even in modern cosmology, they talk of the creation originating from the Big Bang. Bang is a sound, a big sound. That is how the creation came. So uh, there was a, a primordial volume uh, uh, of infinity density, of infinity high temperature and uh, infinite energy. And that volume, it exploded in a huge bang. And from that bang, uh, you have the creation of the name. And so, this is how the Shabda Srishti, the creation of the name, the universe of the name from the sound that is there in uh, all philosophies of the world. It is there in Indian philosophy. It is there in Christian mysticism. It may not be there in the Christianity <laughs> practiced by the church. You see, Christianity has two versions. The church practice in Christianity, which is called Chetchiyanti, that is how it is called. So what I said may not, you may not find it in Chetchiyanti. You find it in the Christian mystics, mystics or in the, in the literature of the Christian mystics, where Christian mysticism, there are great uh, mystics of Christianity. There you find some of these philosophical uh, visions. In Chetchiyanti, it is a religion, like any other religion, where you do not have any doctrine. So generally, Indians tend to be a set of dogmas, and they, they, they may not have any doctrine to support them. Uh, so, anyway, so that Shabda's Vishnu, having understood that, the principle of Shabda's Vishnu, then what is that sound, which is the origin of this universe? The answer is, um, that is this one. So, now the sound of Om is a, a truly cosmic sound. Having, uh, having uh, uh, described that much, now I will uh, uh, bring uh, one more aspect as the concluding aspect of uh, my talk, and that is uh, the relevance of this cosmic sound to own in a person's in an individual's life. You see, uh, there is a thing called religion uh, in which you try to worship God in a particular ritual and all that. And the God is himself, God itself, the Godhead itself is visualized in a given form. And a lot of uh, mythology is woven around uh, that worship and around that form. So that is how the religions, uh, a religion is constructed. That is the construct of a religion. Whereas uh, there is a thing called spirituality. The religions may be variegated a different uh, and uh, but the spirituality is one. So all the religions, unless you uh, cross the complex of religion, you cannot arrive at the glory of spirituality. And so Omkara, when a human being, he adopts Omkara in his life, he has already crossed the 
the various imposed by the religion, he transports himself into the higher reaches of spirituality. So, Omkara, it uplifts the human being from the, the base passions of worldliness, certainly, mm. and also from the confines of the religious thinking, it uplifts the human being into the higher reaches of, uh, of the sublime heights of spirituality. That is how Omkara uplifts a person. You see, um, did you hear any time uh, some of the Mahatma's uh, Kashami, the family people, who chant some mantra, but not all. Mm. Don't chant all. You chant some mantra, maybe Om Namah Shivaya, or Om Namah Narayanaya, whatever, uh, but not all. Like that, uh, the Ghrasthas from Kashami by the Mahatma's. In fact, uh, quite often you come across some of the Mahatma's or the Dharmacharyas, or the Matha Acharyas, are saying that Grasthas have no eligibility to chant Om. So like that, uh, it is it started as a Kasham, and then it has uh, it has acquired the shape of a taboo. To begin with, it was not a taboo, it was just a Kasham. Even now, taking it as a taboo, as if Grasthas would be chant Om, uh, they will uh, be doing something wrong, right? That is not logical. It is irrational and we may not pay uh, any attention to that. But is there a caution associated with it? Yes, there is a caution. What is the significance of this caution? You see, suppose you chant Om in a, in a appropriate way. I, I tell you how. You chant Om how. So, you cannot sit uh, in a sofa or a chair comfortably and chant Om. You may not do that. You want the right way of chanting Om would be to sit upright. So tilt the back upright straight. And uh, the body, just I will straight with you, I just uh, the body is, uh, is kept uh, around the vertical axis. This vertical axis is described in great detail with a lot of uh, uh, terminology associated with it. Merudanda, Chakra, Adhava Chakra, Swarishtana, Amahata, this, that lot of knowledge is there. Terminology, I don't want to bother to do all that now. Just this much is enough. The upper part of the body is held, held straight, upright, so that the entire body is now uh, as though around the vertical axis, an imaginary uh, or a visualized vertical axis. This is how we sit. And then keep the body relaxed, not the tight and gripping. It must be relaxed. The uprightness and the relaxation are not opposed to each other. They are complementary. So even as the body remains upright, it can remain relaxed. In fact, you have to keep it relaxed. The hands should be kept in the lap in a very relaxed way, not gripping, very relaxed. And then the shoulders should not be hunched up. The shoulders also are relaxed. But you, don't, you may not relax the back itself like this. That is not happen. The back remains upright. And now uh, I sit quite, uh, uh, quietly. I sit quietly, relaxed, but at the same time, very alert. The alertness and the relaxation, they go together. So as I sit this way, I watch the breath. So uh, the breath, uh, it has its own dynamics, and so the, uh, the inhalation happens, and then uh, the, the air within is thrown out, so the exhalation happens. I am only a witness. Uh, so, I do not control the breath. You may not want to control the breath also. You just watch the breath for a while. So as you watch the breath, the mind becomes free from its incessant flow of thoughts. Because the human mind being what it is, highly agitated and restless, constantly thinking and thinking to no end. So listless thinking, compulsive thinking, that is how the human mind is, especially in modern societies, the movement of the mind has become almost crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that situation has to be altered. And so you just try to watch the breath for a while so that the mind cools down. The mind which is uh, very excited, it cools down and becomes uh, 
are relatively quiet as you watch the breath. So the breath provides an anchor of the mind to hold on to, so that the mind stops jumping all along. And so, having watched the breath for a while, making the mind quiet, cool. So in the, the, in the, in the technical term, so it is called a sattvic. A rajasic mind is made into a sattvic mind. Just by watching the breath for uh, three, four minutes. And then, as the mind has cooled down, you will know it yourself. And then, uh, you start inhaling and exhaling slowly and deeply. In the yoga language, uh, it is called uh, anuloma viloma pranayama. So, inhale slowly and deeply, exhale slowly and deeply without holding the breath, either within or without. You should not hold the breath. Holding the breath uh, brings a new dimension into the whole practice, so I advise investing. So you may not hold the breath anywhere inside or outside. Just inhale deeply, and while inhaling, you may not uh, chant Om. You should not chant Om. Only while exhaling, you should chant Om. The reason is, while exhaling, the flow of breath, of the flow of breath, the life-giving air is of words, and when chanting Om, the flow of the life's, uh, the vital force, the flow of the vital force is also of words. For example, when you chant Om, it originates in the navel. If you keenly observe, you can notice its origination in the navel, but even in a rough way, you can see that it is originating in the heart, in the center of the heart. Roughly. So, it originates in the heart, it may be a navel if you can notice it deeply. So, it originates here and it goes up when you chant home. Oh, oh, it goes up and it comes to the throat. But then uh, you can recognize its movement of words, particularly well, between the eyebrows, and then it hits the top of the head, what they call Brahma or Mutha. That is the movement of vital force during the chant of Om. And therefore, the, the flow of the air should be aligned with the Om, should not be opposed to the Om. Therefore, you chant, you inhale quietly, consciously, you inhale, don't chant Om. And while exhaling, you chant Om. Om. That is the one round. And then, after a very small fraction of a second gap, again you deeply inhale. And without holding the breath with it, again you chant Om while exhaling the breath. This is the practice of Om. This practice of Omkara, together with Anuloma Viloma of the breathing, this is the essence of Anuloma Viloma Pranayama. This Pranayama, uh, uh, sometime back, the family people were advised that go slow on it, don't uh, rush into it. You know what a caution is not a taboo. I do not agree that a taboo. There is no taboo for chanting home. You have to chant it the right way and it's all. The caution is that uh, if you chant it uh, with the enthusiasm, you will lose your uh, passion for the body. That is the caution. Suppose a young man who is uh, just that married and now he is going for the honeymoon and comes to Swami for blessing. It happens to me all the time. They come to me to take blessing about to go to honeymoon. And then he comes with a bundle of fruits and all that. Then I want that he advises, he asks for a Swami to give an advice to the newly wedded couple. So suppose I advise him, you chant home like this, then <laughs> so he will lose interest in the honeymoon. And if he still pursues the, suppose he pursues the honeymoon, and during the honeymoon he chants this, then he may not be fulfilled the aspirations of his beloved. Because she has, she, he, she wants to go to a movie, Vishwar Rumah, and then this man says, what is there in the So this kind of uh, the problem could be there. And if the person is uh, very worldly, and he wants to be worldly, and if, if, uh, if we, to see a need to remain worldly, a 
at least for some time. Then that, they are advised not to pursue the chant of Omkara as so much. That is the caution. Why did I mention this? You know, this I mentioned that not to advise you that way. That is not the purpose of my mentioning it. By mentioning this purpose is uh, the chant of Omkara, it is very powerful. Under its power, its value, its significance, you can experience it directly in your life, now or here. That is its power. It uplifts the human heart from the morass of the worldly passions. And uh, you need not do anything. Suppose I ask you, which is passionate? I cultivate my idea. So, it is a lecture, like uh, our Confucian's advice, people should not be corrupt, they should not take bribes, like that they do lectures, but nothing happens. Mm. That doesn't bring that inner transformation. The inner transformation has to happen in a particular way. For that, the sadhana is own karma, that brings the inner transformation. Suppose you are given to anger, suppose. What all you have to do is, Wherever you find that the hint of becoming angry, means first you get irritated, then that irritation grows into anger. So at the first hint of annoyance or irritation, you withdraw yourself from the situation, go into a uh, dark room, a semi-dark room, close the door, sit the way I suggested, and chant Omkara ten times. Your anger will dissipate. You will just evaporate. And you practice this three or four times, and then you will not get anger anymore. It won't come anywhere near you. So, Omkara is the viable means of the inner transformation of the human being. And the, the religion, the, the religiosity, and the morality, ethics, etc., uh, will be very superficial unless. There is that inner transformation in the human being. And that if one method has to be suggested for that inner transformation, that is the Omkara. It is not a religious practice, it is a spiritual practice. And therefore, you are already, you have left behind the, the religious uh, um, uh, imprint or religious uh, stamp, you have left it behind by the time you come to the chant of Omkara. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether a person is a Hindu or Christian or Muslim or whatever, anyway. Therefore, they can take to the original chant itself and the practice the chant of all. Therefore, that brings out the inner transformation in the human being. That is the point, that, that, that is the important point. Otherwise, simply uh, singing the glory of Omkara as it is the natural sound or cosmic sound, etc. Uh, so that doesn't uh, uh, matter much. So what? What is in it for me? That is the most important thing. And therefore, Omkara is the, the chant of Omkara the right way. Understanding its significance, its glory, and contemplating upon its uh, beauty, upon its uh, uh, depth and width. Its depth is uh, it can bring out the innate divinity within you. That is its depth. When its width is, it can encompass the entire humanity into one reality. That is the width. That is the glory of Omkara. And by chanting it the right way, a person can change the course of his life itself. And that can bring a real, real inner transformation that makes the man, the animal man, into a normal man, and then the normal man into a superman, and then the superman into a into divine human being, and then the divine human being into the divinity itself. That prophecy comes from us. That vision that every human being is potentially divine, as the Lord has called it. So every human being. Being is potentially divine. And then I am paraphrasing these words in one of words, the religions, the temples, the churches, the scriptures, the religious practices, they, they all have only value only if 
they help the individual to express that innate divinity, to manifest that innate divinity. In, in the when they cannot help the person to manifest their innate divinity, they have no value also. Therefore, if there is one valuable means of manifesting that innate divinity within the human being, that is to own the sound of own. It is at once the cosmic sound and also the sound within the human heart that can uplift the human being from the worldliness and from the confines or even sometimes the fetters of the religiosity into the freedom of the moksha, the freedom of the universality. So that is the glory of Omkara. And so within a given time, I try to present a cogent description of Omkara by taking a few four, three or four aspects of it. One rules are written on Omkara and so uh, please adopt this sacred sound of Om and be fulfilled in life. May God give all of you and all of us for that matter the wisdom uh, to adopt the Om and be fulfilled uh, in our life now and here. With that prayer,